Thank you. It's, uh, what a great venue this is. It's terrific, actually. You know, um, I was going to start with a joke, but I have to tell you truth first because truth is uh, stranger than fiction because fiction has to make sense. Um, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I were just, just packing up uh, her Subaru uh, to, to go to the airport to fly over to Honolulu for the American Psychological Association convention. And um, it was about 95 degrees in eastern Washington at the time. And the handbrake was set on the Subaru with a very, very slight incline in our long driveway. And as I put the 65 pound or so suitcase in there, at least it seemed like it weighed that much, I went back in to get more. It slowly began to back itself down the driveway. Now, there's also a lawn, which is another bit, little bit of a down go. So it goes off onto the lawn, turns itself around, and goes forward, OK? <laughs> now, it's only about another 75 feet gaining speed before we get to a 20-foot rock cliff that goes onto the highway. So it gets to the rock cliff and <laughs> off onto the highway. Luckily, nobody was there. Uh, but according to people who stopped, instead of driving into it, it bounced off the nose. Uh, and as it bounces off the nose, the deck lid closes, carefully preserving the suitcase and all the rest of the stuff. It then bounces back on the tail, back on the nose, and parks itself almost perfectly parallel, halfway off the road in the opposite direction. So I get down there, and I look at it, and there's no glass. It's not, it hasn't rolled over. So I get in, take the brake off, and drive it back up the house, change suitcases. <laughs> so, so, so. <laughs> It, it is total, I might say. It is total. It didn't sound too good getting up there, but uh, you know. But that's that's the truth of it all. So anyway, um, uh, I got interested in uh, rest before it was called rest. Um, out of my work in hypnosis, most of my most of my publications uh, are in hypnosis, but I've been publishing in rest uh, oh between the nineteen seventies and uh, early nineteen nineties, roughly. So we're going to go back to the, kind of the original starting things here and just kind of give you flavor for some of this. Because it, it, it shows you how hypnosis can, can improve performance in, in a lot of areas and how, the, how rest itself is adjunctive, not just by itself, in helping um, precipitate positive effects from, from other kinds of treatments. So there was a time back in the 70s when you know, one of the biggest impediments to using hypnosis with uh, patients was the fact that not everybody is hypnotizable. It's an ability. It's about 70% genetic. And you know, about 5-10% aren't hypnotizable. A bunch of people aren't terribly hypnotizable. Most people are in the middle. It's almost normally distributed and so on. So the problem is that we, need, we want to increase hypnotizability. Well, a guy named John Zubeck at McGill University published a book, I believe, 1969. Peter Zubeck will correct me if I'm wrong on remembering that date. University of Manitoba. Thank you. Thank you. That was, uh, um, and, uh, that had a little section in it on how sensory deprivation would increase responsiveness to suggestion. Of course, it didn't actually measure hypnotizability. So I thought, well, you know, I've got to do this. Unfortunately, at the time, there were a number of studies that came out in the hypnosis literature um, where it was said that basically, if you do an experiment with sensory deprivation, because you call it sensory deprivation, people are going to fake their scores. Not intentionally, but it's going to be an effect of the, the setting. It was told it was sensory deprivation. So I wanted to find a setting that would be um, where we weren't calling it sensory deprivation, but yet we had an isolation effect. Another thing was coming out was this idea that there was a correlation between waking eyes closed alpha, and it turns out it's actually high theta and low alpha EEG, and hypnotizability, but some guy, some guy by the name of Dumas, actually working out of Jack Hilgard's lab, um, said, published this paper on, well, it's entirely due to volunteering. So people who volunteer for studies give you that correlation, but people who are drafted don't. I didn't believe that, but you know, so I thought we'd better study this. So now I have to find drafted subjects who aren't really drafted, who don't think they're drafted, and I have to find an isolation situation to <laughs> see whether or not it increases hypnotizability without telling them in a hypnosis experiment. Now, we have this pesky thing in Canada and the United States called the Human Subjects Committee, or the Institutional Review Board, or whatever it is. I served on that, by the way. What I'm going to do when I retire at 70, by the way, is I'm going to take one of the old Nazi experiments, 
and I'm going to put it in the proper language, and I'm going to run it through the IRB, and I'm willing to bet that we can, we can get one of those through, but we have trouble getting a sensory deprivation study through. So, so, the, so, the, so the answer there was, uh, what I'll do is I'll propose this to the National Science Foundation. So they have this, this division of polar biology and medicine, and they accept papers from psychologists. And, well, they accept the submission, but they actually don't fund psychology. They only fund polar biology and medicine. So I couldn't get NSF to fund this thing. So now I've got to find some place to make NSF fund this because they're the, they're the outfit that supplies logistics through the US Navy and so forth to get to Antarctica. So the answer is I send my Vita to all of the universities in New Zealand. And curiously enough, the University of Canterbury on the South Island, which is a jumping off point for Antarctica, for US logistics, hires me. Little did they know that I was going to be doing this. So shortly thereafter, you know, I, I, what I discovered was the fact is that part of the trade for letting them use Christchurch and letting you know, all these Yanks invade the place, you know, uh, you know, is that they have to give them free logistics for the New Zealand Scott base, which is like only 10 people, 60 people in the summer, whereas McBurdo was, was in the US base is 700 to 1,000. But you know, big difference, so it doesn't cost them much. So this was the trick. I put it through the New Zealand process, which was no trouble at all. And um, because they wanted somebody to do physiological work down there, so I could do that. So that was fine. So they got what they wanted. And I was able to do the hypnosis part at the same time. So this is how we actually forced NSF to fund my project. So it's, uh, <laughs> so what we have is, does isolation rest, in fact, as we, as we properly termed it, thanks to Peter Sudfeld, Enhance hypnotizability. It's increase a person's ability to respond to hypnosis, which is great for pain. Hypnosis is NIH approved for uh, pain. It works as well as a lot of chemical analgesics and better than some, for example, and very good for a lot of other things as well. Uh, we'll talk to you later about um, using hypnosis for uh, uh, adjunctively as part of the abreactive cure for PTSD, which we have two placebo controlled studies. We can do it in six hours with hypnosis now. How about that? We'll talk to you about that later. Um, and how can we mask the subject? Well, it turns out that when you are a wintering over person at Scott Base, uh, whether you're a cook, uh, you're a person who, who goes and checks machines for data collection and writes these things down, does these things, you automatically volunteer for any studies that are going on. So they're already drafted. So they don't even, you know, they have no choice, which is ideal, you know. <laughs> and we don't have any pesky IRB to put up with either, you know. The only rule is you have to debrief them after the experiment. But curiously enough, at the time, they didn't even say how long after. Some of these people still don't know they were in this experiment. You know? <laughs> so anyway, this is what Scott Bass looked like back in 1975, 76. And uh, that's the EEG machine we used to see how much it was to measure uh, the alpha and so forth. And that was uh, supplied by the Sanii uh, company from Japan. Uh, who we traded uh, sheep pelts to for this, by the way. Uh, and they're very happy to do that. And they, they still, they advertised all this stuff down there. Look how tough our equipment is because it survived Antarctica. Um, and actually it did survive amazingly well because the US Navy dropped the box off the end of a front loader into a lot of other equipment and it did actually survive quite well. Um, at least none of the subjects complained about being shocked or anything like that. So. Um, that is the hallway on the right, which is about four inches of ice in it. And the labs are, the, the hallway is not heated, as you can tell. Um, and the labs just go off from one part of the hallway, sleeping areas and so forth. So basically you'd run in your normal, normal Antarctic clothing, you know, sweaters and wool pants and so on from one lab to the other. And basically the game was somebody who was fully dressed to go outside would stop and start a conversation up with you and you're supposed to be tough and not be bothered that it's 40 degrees below zero. Uh, so, and down in the lower left-hand corner, we're the only, it was the only country then still using dog sleds. And the, the passenger there in the huge red outfit actually is, was the secretary of the Navy at the time, Middendorf. And the New Zealanders were going to play. And then we have now 60 photographers. You know, it cost 50,000 bucks then to bring people there. We had 50 plus photographers in the United States taking pictures of Middendorf. So the Kiwis decided, my good friends decided, they're going to set him up and let him try and drive the dog sled. Now, our do the dog sled people in New Zealand aren't terribly great. And he just said, well, I guess I could try. 
Anyway, he did perfect, perfect figure eights that turned out he had spent quite a bit of his life in Alaska. So he had no trouble with dogs at all. He gave out this shrieking whistle. And so I, 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 I clapped for our side, and the Zealanders are very depressed about that. And, um, and the uh, side on the right there in the bottom right corner, that's, that's me and uh, um, Captain Nordhill, who was the uh, head of uh, Detachment Delta. It was, it was also a good, fun pilot to fly with. Um, so here's a, that's Mount Erebus. Uh, that's the huge mountain near Scott Base uh, and uh, McMurdo. That uh, New Zealand Airlines crashed a DC-10 full of paying passengers into. Uh, I actually wrote an article suggesting that they shouldn't conduct these flights uh, because DC-10s do not make low-level, you know, good sightseeing aircraft. Um, but uh, it wasn't people didn't pay attention to it. Um, that's one of our planes. It's a C-130 uh, ski plane landing, and uh, some little background there. And that's a Weddell seal on the, on the right, and. Uh, they get fed to the dogs, and the, unfortunately, they just walk up and club them over the head, and that's the end of that. And they have special permission environmentally to do that. So anyway, let's get back to the data here. Uh, so, uh, so, so the, the big thing is I won't, I won't bore you with all the data, because you, know, this, you, you won't be able to see the numbers anyway there. But Antarctic winter, wintering over isolation did increase hypnotizability. And we used the scale. It didn't involve, hypno, it didn't involve direct hypnotic induction with it. It was a significant increase. So we discovered there is a link between isolation and increasing hypnotizability um, because a person gets to be more internally oriented when they might not be otherwise. You know, that's, that's how they put up with it. Isolation in the winter is basically they're anosmic, they're anosmic to all odors except the odors in the base, which are cooking odors, odors and, uh, and you know, some uh, restroom odors, if you will. And that's about it, really. And they have 24 hours of darkness during the winter. So it's, you know, there is quite a bit of isolation going on. We also did alpha EEG density uh, increases there. I had a really good picture of that, but I don't know what happened to it. Uh, we, we, have, we actually practiced in a prison in New Zealand because the space was for, for three of us to work, my, my two technicians and myself, plus the subject, we had very limited space to work in. So we, we spent a lot of time doing that. So now that we have it established, and we know the drafting doesn't make that much difference, it was now time to see whether we can do some practic something practical that would be useful clinically. So um, this is my lab uh, in, um, the, at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. Um, and uh, that's also the EEG machine. So we're, we measured in this particular study. This is six hours of rest. Um, and this is, we did this back in the uh, late 70s. Um, and we measured skin conductance and skin peripheral skin temperature and core temperature. And we did EEG uh, uh, measures so we could do the alpha density and measure theta and a lot of other things like that. Um, and uh, we had uh, my assistant there, Kate Abelson, after we'd closed the door. By the way, we used female subjects because um, they have better bladder capacity than males, so the ones that can actually last six hours. Great attention to detail here. So we, we took we took nursing students and uh, uh, they they all did, did fine with that. Um, and um, as we closed the second double handled door, which are basically these are doors they use like on freezers, you know, kind of things. Um, uh, the uh, Kate would look at me and say, "Well, do you think she'll crack?" You know. And so we monitored what craving for stimulation. They'd push a button uh, if they were getting bored, and we'd give them stock market quotes the same three stock market quotes over and over again. So uh, we had a criteria for removing them from rest in case they were having a real problem. So we had three criteria. They had to show, show three criteria for craving for stimulation. Someone would try to count, would feel and try to count the uh, uh, little holes in the acoustic tile. And then the people would go for the stock market quotes. Basically, the remarkable thing is we only took one person out at about five hours instead of six hours. Uh, so we didn't have this horrible effect that we were told was going to happen from sensory deprivation, you know. And they came out and said they really liked it. Now, the interesting thing here is we measured this with a real hypnotizability scale, one that had just come out at Stanford called the Stanford Hypnotic Clinical Scale. And it was only five points. We embedded that scale in dozens of other measures. Um, so it wasn't like the primary focus, the idea that the, 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 they couldn't complain about the study people figuring out it was about hypnosis because it was a hypnotizability scale, because it was just one of many, many, many scales they took. Uh, and then we measured them before, and then before we took them out of the chamber, 
and then we measured them 10, 10 days to 14 days later. And also, the idea is, well, of course, anybody can, after uh, being saying, well, in your hands are, are feeling like there's magnets attracted to each other, and they're moving closer, and anybody can fake that, and they kind of figure out what you want to do. So we thought we better have a real criteria. Well, so we added a pain suggestion for increased pain tolerance and used a shock device. Um, and the incredible thing is for pain tolerance, this, this thing would only go to 900 volts. I mean, we're talking, we put on the back of the hand, the hand would actually go out like this. And we had people that exceeded pain tolerance with the suggestion for um, increased pain tolerance. They would feel, their, their, their hand would be entirely anesthetized, be like leather, as if the electrodes were sitting on top of leather. Um, with that hypnotic suggestion after. So we had the pre and post measures. We also did something called pain uh, threshold, which turns out to be a real problem in terms of really measuring it. So here's the data. Uh, the scale is the Stanford clinic, uh, hypnotic clinical scale, the five point scale. But I wanted to make the, I wanted to make the graph look really nice. So I, but if you just multiply every, the uh, pain threshold and tolerance scores by 10, you can put it all in the same graph. The point was, the pain threshold, there was no change in pain threshold at all. And that's kind of a bogus measure because we don't know what, what, what the pain threshold to one person is not to another person. That's been abandoned in the literature. We use things called ischemic pain and cold pressure pain now. But the thing is, hypnotizability went up from 1.7 uh, average score, mean score, to um, in excess of, it was actually 4.2. It says 4.0 there. It was actually 4.2 in this first study. Uh, and it was maintained at, 10, uh, at uh, 10 days to two weeks. So once they learned this skill, they were actually able to do this, uh, which, is, which is pretty neat. Uh, actually, we actually tested me on this, by the way, years later in my lab at the University of, uh, uh, at uh, Washington State University, using the 12 point scale. And the scale that's 12 points is, um, this is the Stanford Hypnotic Susceptibility Scale. And there's a lot of research on this. There's actually the work that Hilgard did over 20 years at Stanford, it, it helps to be dean first. Then you can do your, he made his name in, in behavioral research in learning theory, became dean, and then gave himself the funding and the building to do the hypnosis research. So it's something you always want to do, actually. Very, you know, it really helps to be able to do that. And uh, so they developed these great scales that are very reliable uh, that you can use. But they're, not, they're good for research settings. They're not very good for clinical settings. So they take over an hour. But there's one of these items is called anosmia to ammonia. And you take this bottle of ammonia and you tell the person in hypnosis, after you've been exposed to hypnosis and they've already passed these other items, that uh, they're going to have, they won't be able to smell any odors at all. And I take a whiff of this and you put this ammonia directly underneath their nose and I take a big whiff of this, you know. Well, you know, my, my score on that scale was about two. I was terrible. But since the sensory deprivation thing worked, I figured, you know, it took me 10 years before I figured I'd actually use my, do myself. So they ran, ran me as a subject. So we got to that particular item nine on the Stanford scale. Well, you know, I knew what the item was, even though I was hypnotized, you know, responding to this thing. So I thought my graduate students were completely putting me on. So I opened my eyes and sure enough, it actually was the ammonia. So I was quite amazed actually, because my expectation was that that was a fake and it really came out pretty well. So, um, so pretty interesting. Um, Anyway, that's the hypnosis part, which we used to call animal magnetism. And uh, so we have, it's a downside of animal magnetism, I guess. Um, so um, let's move on uh, in time here to uh, dry flotation, use of dry flotation test, uh, uh, measures for uh, increasing performance like marksmanship. In this particular study, um, we used uh, 24 uh, students enrolled in a marksmanship training class at Washington State University. Um, and you had nine, nine males and three females in each group. And these folks were, were pretty much plateaued at a score of con very continuous scores before we started them. In other words, it wasn't like an intramural group of people shooting for fun. This, these were ROTC folks that were really trying to get up. And they pretty much plateaued. We had really good people, bad people kind of in between. And so this is pretty where, so we were able to match the groups for um, within, within three points and then expose them to, um, to rest. We use dry flotation. It, the one advantage of dry flotation rest is that it's a terrific interim method to get people. I, I had both a wet tank at the time, dry tank, and also we still have a chamber in my laboratory. I'll be retiring soon, so my lab is in the process of closing, so I'm actually selling my dry flotation uh, tank now. Um, the advertisement for that's out there. Um, and um, the, uh, 
the deal with this is uh, the dry flotation tank comes with a lot of frills that people like, which, which, is not, which have nothing to do with rest. I mean, my, this tank that I have, the dry flotation tank, has a underwater spa type water jets that go up and down your back if you hook it up to a spa equipment. It has uh, these fabulous Danish stereo speakers in it. It's, it has sand filled walls, the sound vibration damping is really good. Um, it's, it's a super low tactile kind of uh, plush, plush material that sits over the top of it. So there are people who would never get into the wet tank. You get into this thing and you say, but there's something even more. You could, and by the time they do this, they're more likely to get into the wet tank. We've had some of those little transition things. We didn't publish that though, it's kind of interesting. Um, with the dry flotation, uh, we actually use, we actually have to, we uh, warm the water to not, not, not roughly 92, 93 degrees we do in wet rest, but about roughly about 95 Fahrenheit uh, for doing that because of the, because you've got more of your body is exposed to the air. Uh, and then we use this, this uh, negative ion generated uh, uh, charcoal filtered air, just like you do in a lot of the wet tanks as well. So a lot of that's exactly the same. Um, that's what it looks like. And that's finished in lemon oil. So you don't have any petroleum byproducts evaporating inside the, inside the room or inside the actual chamber. And this is a deal for performance on top. It's a, a piece of uh, tempered glass where you can put uh, video. Uh, so if you want to have demonstrate golf or you know, proficient uh, race driving and that kind of thing. I, I did that before I ran the uh, Formula Atlantic uh, race at uh, National Championship race for myself. And actually, unfortunately, uh, uh, imprinted on a guy that was slower than me. Yeah, but uh, we won anyway, but nonetheless, it was, you know. Uh, and that's what it looks like. Uh, there's spe that's the speakers for the front. And as, you know, person, the uh, subject can, uh, can adjust the, the amount of ventilation and can adjust the, they can actually turn the lights on with the dimmer if they want to, you know, at any time. So it's, a, it's an environment which is a pretty inviting environment compared to some of the other ones. Good transition environment and works, it replicates the results we get with chamber rest, which you cannot obtain with some of the with with wet rest in some cases, like hypnotizability changes and some other things. Um, oh, there's the the Danish speakers in the back end of it. So the control condition, by the way, we use we want to use a control condition, which is a really legitimate control condition. And I think most people know that hypnosis, although hypnosis does not require relaxation, there's probably a hundred studies, well, maybe two hundred now in, in uh, tier one journals like International Journal of Clinical and Experimental Hypnosis, Journal of Abnormal, which has showed that it gives tremendously effective relaxation effects. So our control condition was actually a relaxation condition. And then we gave them some BS from uh, how relaxation enhances your marksmanship performance, which isn't really total BS, which was basically just information on that. And we just used for, our, so we could replicate this, Everybody, we just read the first, the induction from the Stanford Clinical Scale, which takes less than five minutes to read the uh, hypnotic induction for that. And it's a, you know, progressive relaxation, kind of Joseph Wopi, you know, let your right foot relax, your left foot relax, and moving on up through your body. So it's, it's a lot of um, effect there. Now, the experimental group was, uh, uh, I'm looking at the salt replica here, and it's giving me a, PTSD traumatic response to cleaning up my lab every time the pool people would come, come by. We ended up Washington State University was plagued by the pool inspection people coming by at random intervals as well, you know. Um, so constantly they're trying to clean up the salt. But um, uh, hence my, my fascination with dry flotation rest for a period. Um, um, and um, so uh, Anyway, we'd orient them to the dry flotation chamber, and they were only exposed to 50 minutes of dry rest. Uh, and this, was, this was in um, uh, um, the, an unlighted condition. There is no attempt to provide a video or any of this imagery or any of that other sort of stuff during or after rest. Uh, and they were simply assessed within 48 hours. And uh, what actually happened uh, then was the, uh, um, it was all done under the uh, ROTC supervisor's instructions, and then we, you know, was the uh, shots were fired from the same unsupported prone positions, all carefully controlled and we used these national competition targets and so on. And then this, the targets were scored by these ROTC cadet instructors, um, but they did not know who was in the experimental group and who was in the control group, you know, which is the way you're supposed to do this. So um, here's what actually happened is um, the rest condition uh, only 50 minutes of rest, one exposure, 
uh, at least within a couple day period, um, showed um, marksmanship improvements in people who had already plateaued on marksmanship. That's the important thing. They're already plateaued. They weren't improving anymore as a result of instruction. So that's kind of, that's pretty cool. Um, uh, Peter Sudfeld did a basketball study, and we did a basketball study. So this is a dissertation by Jeffrey Wegeman uh, at WSU, and we had 22 expert collegiate basketball players from uh, what was then Pac-10 team WSU, and then also the University of Idaho. That's only about um, nine miles from Washington State University. So we consider these these are really expert players, um, and um, we had all sorts of objective scores. We had coaches that didn't know who had rest and who did not have have the rest condition. Um, and uh, this is this is kind of an interesting study as well. Uh, the um, the student in question wound up being put on probation for doing this. It drew so much excitement that he got a newspaper uh, uh, inquiry, and he re revealed the name of one of the people in the study. Um, and um, it turned out to be Brian Quinette. I'm going to reveal it again because it's already been revealed. You know, it's, this is not new news. Um, who managed to score after one hour in in uh, in rest, 60 points in one game. 60 points. By the way, Washington State University still had the ability to grasp defeat from the jaws of victory by putting in people after that who hadn't been allowed to play before, and we still lost by four points. Yeah. Yes. We can only do that at Washington State University. It's, it's remarkable. You know. Anyway, he's, he, I think he, Brian's retired from the NBA now, but, uh, but uh, he gave a, after, anyway, the release thing was, you know, the uh, University of Washington should watch, State, uh, University of Washington watch out because WSU has a tank, and of course it was downhill from there, you know, so. Um, so anyway, we did another study, it was a tennis performance study, and this was um, Patrick McElhaney uh, was the uh, PhD student on that one, and we had uh, significantly improved game performance, and this was also measured in intercollegiate competition, and we used, we used imagery plus, plus rest versus imagery alone because the imagery condition also had, had some positive effects as well. So that's you know, pretty neat stuff. Um, last one, I'm at, oops, oh, here we go. Um, so the dry flotation study, this increased hypnotizability and pain control. This is the first study that actually used dry flotation rest uh, for increasing hypnotizability. Wet flotation rest did not work for that. We tried it four and four or five different experiments, had no significant results. Uh, apparently, uh, wet rest is perhaps too much fun. You know, I don't know. Um, so um, we tried lighted and unlighted conditions. And one of the problems with long periods of rest, like six hours in a darkened condition, that people will fall asleep and you lose the rest effects. Um, so we tested lighted and unlighted conditions. And we used uh, the Stanford hypnotizability uh, test scores again, test before and after in a two weeks follow-up, very much like we did in the New Zealand study. And we used a much better measure of pain to use the pain criteria. It's called ischemic pain. This is a, a deal where you put the blood pressure cuff on the subject and you inflate it to, what is it, uh, 240 millimeters of mercury, something like that, you know. And then you have them squeeze a hand dynamometer to 10, 10 kgs. Anyway, this creates a very painful situation, which is considered to be similar to post-operative pain. And you'll ask the person to report over a minute, you know, like, on a, on a one to 10, where 10 is a point where you'd like us really to take the cuff off, you know, tell us how you're doing. You know, so one, two, the people who are not in the, who are, who are not in the rest condition, uh, three, four, or five, you know, and, you know, 10, oh, please keep on reporting. Most people can do this, you know, 12, 13, you know. People in the rest condition uh, with the pain tolerance increase, we had people that had had these kinds of scores over that minute and a half. You can't leave it on much longer. You do tissue damage, and not a good thing. You know, blood, you know, blood vessel damage. You know, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be, we try to take good care of our subjects and minimize the tissue damage. Um, so, um, so the interesting thing is, again, uh, the dry flotation rest, increased hypnotizability, and pain tolerance. It had, with this idea of pain reduction with rest by itself hasn't been tied into this kind of work, uh, and that was kind of one of the things we are going to do next. So running low on time here, uh, I'll plug my books. Um, the left one is my uh, uh, hypnotherapeutic techniques book, which is now the national text for medical schools in Romania as well, you know, translated in Romanian. 
It's with uh, John G. Watkins, who a lot of you have heard about. He just passed away about a year ago at 98. Um, and um, the um, next one is the, adva the Advanced Hypnotherapy book, which is a more psychodynamic one. And then the one that just came out in 2010 is uh, the Medical Hypnosis uh, Primer um, for people who don't know anything about hypnosis. So there we are. Um,